How's it going folks? Brian Cusco here at Triple B. You know I, I highly considered taking today off, but instead, Merry Christmas YouTube. Today we are going back to the Herpeton Talks with Taylor Rausch giving a talk on bioactive substrates. Without further ado, you're watching Triple B TV. Guys, and please introduce me. I'm Taylor. Um, again, I've kept reptiles for a long time. I'm gonna jump right into it. I'm a little nervous. It was first seen in Philippe's book, uh, The Art of Keeping Snakes, um, on keeping, you know, the, the breakdown of like fecals and stuff, just bioactive enclosures. Uh, the goal is to keep, you know, vivariums, bioactive substrates, can offer functional component that breaks down fecals and facilitates ma like maintenance. They can look good as well um, in nature bioactive substrates generate micro-ecological systems that rely on bacteria and fungi to break down the waste and prevent odor and kelp recycle all everything in there. Um, the current trend is to label as bioactive substrates um, with invertebrates. Bioactive substrates can function primarily in the activity of bacteria and fungi. Uh, bioactive substrates are generally used in naturalistic vivariums with small to medium species and can be used with large species if the fecals are taken out Naturalistic designs is not required as long as there is soil in the substrate, and microfauna and microflora. Bioactive substrates generally are applicable to humid moist vivariums because the de degree of moisture is necessary for the breakdown and the, the life of you know, isopods and fungi and bacteria to thrive. Um, they can't be used in desert arid vivariums. There are some things that can facilitate into that, but it's not as diverse as you would in vivariums. Um, this is just some that I've made with, middle one is not as appropriate as there is more moss on top. You don't want to use that as much, but there are different layers that need to be facilitated in there. Um, in vivariums, the top layer is always exposed to the air, so it dries out faster. It doesn't keep all the microfauna and stuff. It goes, it needs to be deeper. So fungal and bacterial components thrive in the deeper moisture layers. There is a, if there is a barrier such as like moss or leaf litter, uh, it preventing the air from drying out, or from the top layer from drying out. Um, moss can be used, but it's not always the best because you will create like not, nothing going deeper into the soil. You will want to kind of stir it around a little bit, but the lower levels are the most bioactive where all your roots are and all your isopods will be down in and your fungal, like mycorrhizal fungals and stuff. Uh, leaf litter is a better choice to keep on top with most bioactive enclosures. Um, the first step is to, like, this is all formulas, but the first step is to create a drainage layer on the bottom if you're going to have having plants, primarily. Um, gravel, hydroponic clay pellets work great. Egg crate can be work, uh, used. Plastic, and then you want to do your screen layer to prevent, like, soil going down there, as is most building most vivariums. It'll prevent the substrate from getting soggy or over water, which can kill all your beneficial stuff in there. Um, as a general formula, the, com the following components can vary in ratios, which will help establish your bioactive flora, depending on what you're keeping in the vivarium itself, um, whether it be plant heavy or you know frogs or a larger animal. Peat moss, cocoa fiber, husk cocoa chips, um, sphagnum moss, orchid bark, fir, which is like a fir bark. Charcoal is optional, but it's also really beneficial to the springtails in there. And then a sand is also good. Um, adding mycorrhizal fungi, which is really beneficial to plants, and some of your microfaunas will help eat it as well, um, can be useful in a lot of naturalistic stuff with a lot of live plants, which if you're doing you know, amphibians, it's really beneficial to that as well. Uh, detrivores, which are springtails, isopods, and other micro-like insects, uh, will help consume larger waste um, and make them more readily available to the bacterial flora. If you add leaf litter, it'll also be beneficial to a lot of your detrivores. They'll eat that if there's nothing for them to eat at the moment, and then they'll go deeper, deeper into the substrate. Stirring is necessary. It doesn't have to be once a week. It can be once a week, once a month, as long as it's moving things from the top to the bottom. That'll help really like air your soil and get everything down there to get broken down appropriately. Moss as a top dressing can impede on movement um, from, to, from the, to the bioactive level. So sticking to leaf litter is usually a better layer. With larger reptiles, like snakes, lizards, bigger things, 
Um, it should be scooped, most of it should be scooped off. Some of it can be stirred in, but most of it should be scooped off because there's a lot of waste to compost and it can start to smell. Detrivores, which is something I really enjoy about the whole bioactive part of enclosures, um, are organisms that ingest and break down larger components in a form to more readily be used by the bioactive flora. Their activity can contribute to moving waste matter to the moist layer uh, where many species in nature, there is a, sele uh, like a limited selection in the hobby. In nature, some things like slugs and snails can carry harmful pathogens to reptiles and amphibians. There are some that can be used, but generally you don't want to use anything in there because it can be detrimental. Some safe invertebrates would be like Priscillianoides, which are like the, your powder, powder blues and your powder oranges and such. Um, they are great for moving organic matter. Uh, they're not as protein driven as like a lot of your Priscillia species um, and they don't they can overpopulate but if you have things in there that'll eat them it'll also help keep the population down it's kind of like a symbiosis thing your dwarf whites um, they're good for overall breakdown they stay smaller you won't really see them at the surface as much um, they're not really that protein driven they do all of them do require it but it's usually more on fecals versus like overcrowding and um, targeting your animals they will move your substrate deeper. Armadillidium is also a good one. Um, they will stay a little bit more to the surface, but they will also deep, deep, dig deeper into the substrate. And your springtails are also necessary. They're hydrophobic invertebrates, but they will break down things at a deeper level. They will go crazy. And if you have like, if you're raising frogs, like letting the parents raise them in the enclosure, the babies will often take to it, and young frogs will also eat them as well. Um, they're, they don't overpopulate, and if they do, it's not harmful at all. Unsafe detrivores, a lot of the Porcellio species, there are some other species out there that are not necessarily good as well. On the left would be like Porcellio sylvestri, and then the Porcellio like giant orange. Those are not generally safe. They do like a little bit more protein in their diet. Um, on the right hand side would be the Porcellinoides and then springtails. Those are generally really safe, make good feeders for smaller insects and, or, and reptiles and amphibians. So. Balanced substrates should be odorless or like their smell should actually be more of like a rich earthy smell versus like anything stagnant. Like if you smell, smell any kind of like st stagnant sphagnum moss, you shouldn't smell any like acidy things. If the waste load is too big from not scooping out larger waste masses, it will eventually start smelling as like you just have too much in there. Um, adding too much water will also kind of create like its stagnancy because um, it'll cause a lot of the die off of all the beneficial things. Allowing substrate to dry out will also cause initial die off as it will dry everything out too much to the point where it can't come back. And your inverts and like a lot of your bacteria require moisture as well. Um, another way to add bacteria is, is some people will collect things outside, like little bits, and just kind of add it to their vivariums. For like if you had a, an animal from a certain area and you collect a little bit of substrate, um, it'll help create more of like a symbiosis. It'll help create a lot of bacteria and um, inverts with the animal itself, um, and it'll help break things down as well. There are many successful ways to keep it, or to keep reptiles. Uh, you can keep it sterile, or you can keep them in bioactive enclosures. I mean, I've kept bioactive enclosures for invertebrates, um, amphibians, snakes, a lot of things. I've also kept things in sterile environment, environments. It just depends on what you're willing to work with and what is gonna be most beneficial for you and your animal. So I'd like to see a little more studies on um, the like beneficial bacteria and the sim like symbiosis between the two, whether it be like bacteria from the wild and why like why they need it in their in in like in bioactive enclosures or how beneficial it is. I mean, there's a lot out there, but that's really the end of my <laughs> talk. So, if there's any questions or anything? Okay. <laughs> Good job, Taylor. I thought you did a great job. Looking forward to seeing you real soon, sis. Next week, we're starting our Tinley interviews and my new recording technique for the audio. I think it came out really good. I gave a little sneak listen to some of the stuff that's coming up here, and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. And we've got Mr. Earl Jones of Lone Star Reptiles. Until then, you've been watching Triple B TV. Y'all take care. Today we're going to the Herpeton Talks. Next week, we've got Mr. Earl Jones and...